Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. <laughs> what a week! We had the uh, the uh, Oscars, so we little my sister's review of the Oscars will be coming up. But first, uh, what's in the news? So the CDC has now decided we're not going to be testing people from China anymore. Be uh, probably a smart move because it didn't work before. But they are going to continue to uh, randomly sequence uh, folks uh, in various airports and look at the genomes of those viruses. They should have just listened to my podcast last week because we told them, you know, just get wastewater from the airplanes. That's the best way to do it. So I don't know why they're not doing that. They figured it out in their MMWR. They figured out how to do it, but they're not doing it. Uh, good news across the country. Uh, hospitalizations are down. Uh, they're still... Still higher than flu, but they're down, and test positivity is falling. I, th I thought I'd show you this one map. This is uh, 30 days apart looking at the world map, and you can see uh, based on the color. So the lighter the color, the less the virus. Real big changes, mostly in South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, and Zambia, as well as Australia and India. So big, big uh, reductions across those countries. So they're, they're, we're beginning to see benefits all over the place. Uh, if you look at the weekly numbers, uh, slowly trending down in terms of case numbers, if you look at cases per 100,000 based on the states, there's some funny pockets. Maine has got pretty hot, uh, parts of Illinois and Ohio, Louisiana. But if you look at the county map, so this is the CDC publishes a county map, so each county based on whether it has low, moderate, or high risk. High risk here is in brown, and you can see like high risk in Maine. I don't know what's going on there in some parts of the Midwest. Uh, new admissions continue to drop. Uh, you can see overall they continue to fall, particularly in the 70 year olds, which is good. And deaths, again, uh, is a lagging indicator, but beginning to trickle down to the point where it's only, <laughs> I say, uh, only uh, 1,800 people dying per week of this disease, so it's not going away. That's like 97,000 per year. Remember, a couple of, maybe a month ago, it was about 150,000 per year. Bad flu season, 50,000. So it's still twice uh, the mortality, and it's not, you know, it's going into the summer. So we'll see. I haven't shown this data before. This is the benefit of vaccination on hospitalizations, but it's, uh, impressive. So during the Omicron spike, look at the difference if you were vaccinated versus not vaccinated for hospitalizations. But even now, 16-fold benefit of being vaccinated uh, and boosted versus unvaccinated folks who were being hospitalized. And this is the numbers I've shown before in terms of mortality, 10-fold benefit uh, for, uh, for being vaccinated. Now, the, the interesting thing I've mentioned, and it seems to be <laughs> The same thing, it's, it's sort of just around the country. It, we have little spikes and it goes down and up and down. Here's the wastewater data. And the main thing to, I want to point out is that in 18% in of the wastewater uh, uh, reporting uh, sites, there's been a doubling of virus. So it's spotty, but it, and I think this is what we're going to see for the next several months. Spikes in some areas goes down, spikes in other areas. So it's just sort of around the country. I think. The best news, scientifically, is that it ha there's not another mutation on the horizon. It's still XBB 1.5. If it doesn't continue to mutate, and this is the dominant strain, there'll be broad immunity as people either get vaccinated or get infected with this. So this is good news if it'll stay this way. You never know. Uh, Harris County's looking good, and our friends in Dimmick County, they win the prize. No cases last week and no admissions. A couple of javelinas were running havoc, though, but that was it. Uh, good news in the medical center, we continue to trickle down for cases admitted to the hospital being positive. So that's a very good sign. Hospitalizations have plateaued. So there's still a number. Wastewater is in the city of Houston is plateaued finally, but at a very high level. So one of the things we talked about, about if the things we need to do in the future to prevent a pandemic, a responsive pandemic, one of the most important things is how do we prevent the spread of misinformation? And we've talked about it. We've talked about the cultural things that need to happen. Why does it happen? Well, there is finally a paper by this group at, um, uh, in California that published a paper in the National Academy of Science. These are from folks from USC. And, and they tried to address this issue. They got 2,500 users of Facebook. 
Uh, they recruited them online, and they gave them either misinformation headlines, they, two types of headlines, fake headlines and real headlines. Uh, with the question was, is this really, uh, do people pass on information because they, don't, they lack critical thinking, or is it their political beliefs, which is sort of my bias, you know, I, I think it's all, it's all political. But it turns out that's not what they found. So what they found is there are two types of users of, of, of online information. There are habitual uh, users, people who, who habitually get information and pass it on. And then there's the occasional user, user who's much more discriminating. So what they found generally is the, the occasional user is pretty d good at discriminating uh, true from false, where the habitual users just sort of pass the information on. And what they found was 30%, somewhere between 30 and 40% of the false news that we shared was, fo was from 15% of the people they tested, the, which were all habitual users. So there's a group of folks who just, no matter what appears, <laughs> true or false, just pass it on. And the trouble is that the, the, the social uh, network platforms uh, incent people to pass stuff on. So if you, the more times you click through and pass information along, the more likely you are, in fact, to be cited or, or for their information to be picked up in some other feed. So when they actually came up with a tool that could assess whether or not it was true or, true or false, it actually brought down the number of times something that was false was uh, being sent forward. Habitual users will send stuff that's both they believe in and they don't believe in. They're almost neutral to it. They're just passing stuff on. And that ends up being one of the main reasons why there's misinformation that's passed on, this smaller group of people who just keep passing information on. So can it be effective? Well, when they put a, a, this ability to, to assess whether that was true or false, they actually did uh, reduce the number of misinformation uh, that was passed on. So social platforms can make a more active step in determining whether information is right or wrong. Now, there's a big debate, as you know, in the news right now. Are, there, are they newspapers? Well, they're not. So they're not interested in trying to determine uh, what's right and wrong, but they should be because it really is an issue with misinformation being passed on for the next pandemic. So if there was a way to create rewards, for example, for uh, having information that is more, uh, more, more likely correct or true, uh, and incenting those people, in other words, if they pass on true information, they're the ones that get cited, would be better. Uh, so that was a really interesting paper that addressed the issue we've talked about, how do you manage misinformation. Okay, well that's enough science for the, for the week. Because it was the Oscars, and my sister, of course, you know, as I told my sister Janet, is a film, uh, was a film professor, and uh, so she had her review of the Oscars, which I have been asked by many news outlets to share, but because your family, uh, we're sharing it today. So Janet said it was not an outstanding Oscar uh, event. She didn't like any of the movies, so she didn't really care. <laughs> That's my sister. Uh, thought all the dresses were boring and ugly, except for Halle Berry's. Uh, she said the only good news of the whole thing is no one was apparently uh, repellent and no one was slapped. Uh, she liked the fact that talented South Asian actors were finally acknowledged and she was very happy that there was no pointless overdrawn, overdrawn production numbers. Do you remember, I don't know if anybody remembers that one that Rob, that Rob Lowe did with uh, Alan Carr production. It was the single worst 11 minutes of my life. I will never get those 11 minutes back. <laughs> Every time I see Rob Lowe, I want to kill him. Uh, she loved Lenny Kravitz and Lady Gaga, but didn't like the thinly veiled ad for Little Mermaid. And her favorite thing, of course, was, <laughs> and this is only my sister to think of this, asking people to come back to the theaters in mean, all the ads were for streaming services like Netflix. <laughs> and, and Janet, and she, she picked up on that. So of course I had to turn to someone else because my sister. So I asked Lily, what did she think? So Lily has, is highly opinionated about this because her favorite movie is Togo, which was released right at the start of the pandemic. And clearly, talking to Lily, that was clearly the best movie in the entire pandemic and was not even recognized. I mean, can you believe that? And this was another pandemic movie. I mean, this was a story about, uh, you know, in 1925 in Norm, Alaska, uh, there was an outbreak of tonsillitis, they thought, and the children there. And it turned out it wasn't ton tonsillitis at all, it was diphtheria. And two uh, Inipec children died, and then subsequently four or five more. The, the town physician uh, decided that there would be a, a quarantine. 
and they needed uh, uh, they needed antitoxin. So the only antitoxin they had was ineffective because it expired. So they had to send out for this big ship of uh, antitoxin. So. It's 674 miles. It was a terrible winter of 25, uh, terrible t temperatures in the minus 20, minus 30. There was only one way to get there, and it was a musher. And of course, uh, they had a musher uh, there, a very famous one, uh, Leonard Sapala, who had been breeding dogs of a particular breed. Uh, these were uh, dogs that were both a, a mix of Siberian and Alaskan huskies, uh, huskies because they're faster. Siberian huskies are smaller and faster. And they had this one dog named Togo who was just a pain. Much like my Lily. <laughs> Not appreciated, ran away, but just kept being a, a pain, but was very fast. And, and so it turns out he made Togo the lead, the lead dog. And so they go off on this, this long you know, task to, to find the toxin, and the toxin's being sent from Nome. They met midway, yada, yada, they get back. Very da dangerous. Togo did all the work. And here's the real, <laughs> the tragedy of it all. There's this, there was a guy named uh, uh, Gunnar Kaysen who had a 13-dog team that went the la 50 miles from the town uh, to, to meet this, the incoming uh, Togo's team. Uh, they exchanged the antitoxin 50 miles back. They, they're all in the newspaper. Uh, and their, and the, the dog's name was Balto. The Le lead dog was Balto. Now, my kids know Balto because in Central Park, there's a statue for Balto. There is no mention of Togo. Even though Togo did like 300 miles of mushing, did all the work, this Balto dude got all the, all the awards. So this is a great movie because it sets the record right. Uh, it, it shows that, that Togo not Balto, as you can see here, was the real star of the show and saved the lives of many children. And that injustice is being uh, rectified in this uh, Disney movie. So, hate to say it, the movie of the year that was not <laughs> noted in the Oscars, Lily's pick, Togo. Anyway, uh, lots of shout outs this week. Uh, first of all, uh, good luck in today's match. Today is match day, one of the great, great events where Medical students discover they're going to be living and, and learning for their next uh, level of training. Very traumatic, they have no idea. You open an envelope and there you are. So good luck to everyone. Have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week. wonder who that could be. Lily and I want to wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day. Have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.